All right, so welcome to week four of quantum field theory. We are trekking along. We have done a lot. We have quantized the scalar field. We derived the Feynman propagator, which after today's lecture, Johnson will take you through all the steps to actually derive it fully. It's quite a complicated thing to do. I showed you, as usual, I showed you the skeleton of the calculation. And today, and we've spoken about the Lorentz algebra and the Lorentz group. We did a nice deep dive into that. Uh, and today we will be quantizing a spin one half field and developing the algebra for it. And also exploring the Dirac equation, which is sort of the, the next big step, looking at fermion fields, uh, the homework. will be LB. This is the homework. LB 15, 18, 19, and 20. And that will be the start of the S matrix, deriving the Feynman rules, perturbation theory, all of these kinds of things, Wick's theory. So 18, 19, and 20 are on that stuff. That's what I'll be covering next week. That's the that's when you know you're there, we are there. Uh, hopefully a lot of it looks very familiar to quantum mechanics perturbation theory. It should look very familiar. Uh, we'll have a Hamiltonian, we'll split it into its interaction part and free part. We'll do a perturbation series expansion with the interaction part. I mean, if you need a refresher, I would read about perturbation theory in quantum mechanics before you read these chapters because it's very similar. And then 15 is very important, actually. It's not what I'll be covering, but it's on discrete symmetries, charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal. And I'm not gonna really cover it, but it's really important. So please read 15 and know it very well uh, because uh, I'll, we'll, we'll need it. We'll need to talk about discrete symmetries. I'm not gonna cover it really, but uh, that's sort of the uh, idea. So again, 18, 19, and 20 will be on the S matrix and perturbation theory, and 15 will be on discrete symmetries. Hopefully CPT sounds familiar to you guys. Hopefully, okay, maybe not. <laughs> okay, folks, so let's get started. Let's do spin one half. Does anyone have any questions from last time? Are there any questions at all? Anything? Okay. Let's begin. I really hope, fingers crossed, that you really read Lancaster and Blundell because a lot of the things I'm going to be covering are literally there, exactly, kind of in the same form, which I thought was interesting, which tells me that either they had the same sort of influences, talking about spin one half, so let's start with the algebra. So let's first talk about historically what Dirac was trying to do. So we talked about a couple of things last week. We talked about the n-dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. And then we asked ourselves the question, what if we wanted a finite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group? And we came up with an algebra. And did everyone get the homework? Okay, okay. So we, we came up with some representation where we had uh, the generators J mu nu and that they satisfied some sort of representation that looked like this, J mu nu uh, alpha beta equals I delta mu alpha delta uh, nu beta minus delta mu beta delta nu alpha. Okay, we saw that when these things acted on infinitesimal, when we, when we put these as infinitesimal uh, uh, transformations, we got that this representation worked, right? I'll just write that really quick for reference. So we had some V alpha go to some uh, delta alpha beta uh, minus I omega mu nu, um, J mu nu uh, alpha beta, beta, 
right? Uh, where omega mu mu nu was the anti-symmetric anti-symmetric tensor, telling us about that infinitesimal rotation. And so we created some algebra. By the way, I looked at z again. Z has the same thing in there. <laughs> he has the same exact representation. And he does this whole thing. I was like, whoa, this is awesome. So either two, one of two things happened. Either I subliminally remembered it from Z <laughs> or it was a coincidence. So this is exactly in Z. So it's not as special as I, th I'm not as clever as I thought I was <laughs> when I wrote it down. Which actually, actually, if you sit back and think about it, this is kind of the only plausible thing for JMU new alpha beta. It's kind of like the only thing you could do. So does all of this make sense? This is all okay. Hopefully this expression is not daunting now. I hope so. Okay. Okay, so now Dirac sits down and he says, now, originally Dirac didn't actually want to come up with a spin one half representation. That's not what he tried to do. Originally, what he wanted to do was to try and fix the issues with the Klein-Gordon equation. And he said, can I write down another wave equation that uh, is relativistically consistent, but that doesn't have the issues Klein-Gordon had, namely uh, loss of probability conservation and loss of uh, uh, and negative energy states. But as you all should know, the Dirac equation does posit negative energy solutions. And so that I think he kind of ditched. And I think uh, after a certain amount of time, he said, okay, let's have a spin one half representation. Okay, okay so let's begin. So, so it turns out that the, ma the matrices that give us a spin one half representation are these gamma matrices, okay? And I think Lancaster and Blundell go into a long discussion of why they should be four by four, hopefully, and not two by two. Uh, and actually you'll see that really we want two by two representations for the particle, the antiparticle. We want two two by two representations because we, we recall that in quantum mechanics, the spin one half representation is an SU2 representation. So it is two dimensional. So here somehow you're gonna see we have a decoupling right, where we have a decoupling between particle and antiparticle spinners, right, and they're both going to be two by two separately, right, and we'll have a two by two representation for the particle or the right-handed particle and the left-handed particle, okay, that's where we're going. So we have gamma mu's, okay, and they're four by four matrices satisfying this anti-commutation relation. So let's start writing down the algebra. Okay. This is also sometimes called a Clifford algebra. Uh, next week, Johnson will go through the subtleties of why this is so. Clifford algebra, what does that mean? I assume you've all seen this. This is like very standard. Okay, and now I can write down the generators of the theory in the following way. So I have some S mu nu equals I over four, gamma mu gamma nu, commutator, where again, the I over four is just normalization. Okay, now what are the gamma matrices? What are the gamma matrices in this representation? Well, we can write gamma zero, 0, 1, 1, 0. This is four by four. I'm just writing it in block form. Uh, you've definitely seen it like this. Why? Because these ones are actually two by two identity matrices. Okay. And then the gamma uh, i's or uh, the gamma matrices in three space are just zero sigma i minus sigma i zero. Again, the sigma i's are two by two matrices. And so if you plug them in, you get four by four matrices. Hopefully you've seen this notation and it's clear. If it's not, please let me know. And so now the boost generators can be written as uh, S zero I equals I over four, gamma zero, gamma I. And if you plug in what we just got for gamma zero, you get that the boost generators look like this, minus I over two, 
should be a matrix now. Zero is sigma i minus sigma i zero. Okay, so these are the boost generators, right? Because they are constant in time, in the time direction, and the spatial directions are what are going to generate the uh, row, the boosts. Sorry. Okay, and similarly, we can write our generators for rotations as i over four gamma i gamma j right and i can rewrite this and you can show this that this is just uh, one half epsilon ijk what kind of matrix do i want that's the question yes sigma k zero zero sigma k Okay, so we've just written down the algebra. Hopefully this is all familiar from your reading and hopefully none of it looks very daunting yet. Uh, any questions before we continue? Uh, basically the, the J mu news, now I'm writing as S mu news. That's just the standard convention in this kind of new algebra. Cause now, you know, the S mu new is not same as J mu new, right? S mu new is a different representation Okay, still of the same kind of group structure, SO31. This is just a different representation. This is still a Lorentz algebra to some extent, because okay? I'm generating those kinds of uh, transformations. I really encourage you to play around with this. Get like a few sheets of paper. This is what you should be doing after, uh, during every, after every class or during the week when you have a few, few extra minutes. Just play around with some of these things, you know. You know, uh, a famous physicist has given a talk, and he said, "We need all we need to do is shut up and compute." I agree with him. <laughs> just, like, just compute. Just use. Think of like these kinds of things as like tools in your toolkit, right? That now you can do all kinds of things with. Okay. Let's continue then. So now the natural question will be, what will transform under these transformations? Okay, what will transform? Turns out that four component fields will transform under S, uh, S nu nu, right? And we call those four component field spinners. So now the natural thing to ask would be, okay, well, what is the equation of motion whose solutions satisfy this algebra before we do that, we can also write down the commutator between uh, gamma mu and one of the generators in the algebra. And we can write down their commutation relation in the following way, J rho sigma mu nu gamma nu. Okay. This is another commutation relation where this is just the same uh, representation from before. And so now a natural question to ask would be, well, what kinds of equations satisfied? By the way, now I can correspond this to some infinitesimal rotation. So let's just write that down. This is just some one minus, I don't know if I need the factor of i. Let me think. Yeah, so i omega rho sigma, j rho sigma, mu nu, gamma nu, this is just to say that this is like saying that gamma mu is just now Lorentz transform. Okay, so same kind of idea as before. Now we're just using gamma matrices. Again, they satisfy the properties of the Lorentz transformation. That should be uh, intuitive. Where again, omega rho sigma is your anti-symmetric tensor. I got to tell you, anti-symmetry is the best thing ever when you're doing long calculations. It helps you get rid of a lot of stuff. Okay, so now the, the question is, what is the equation in which the gammas are invariant under simultaneous rotations? So in other words, what is, what is an equation I can write down in which the gamma matrices remain invariant under 
Lorenz transformations. Okay. That is the Dirac equation. Okay, that's 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 what it is. So let's pen down the equation. So what is the Dirac equation? It's I gamma mu d mu minus m. Except now our field is going to change. Now instead of phi, our fields are psi, and that's our Dirac equation. I won't write equals zero yet. Okay. Uh, please don't confuse this side. This is not a wave function. It's a, it's a field. It's a four component field and these are called spinner fields. And we're gonna work with them a lot today. Anyone have questions about the Dirac equation yet? I don't think you will. We haven't done anything with it, but okay. So let's play around with this guy. And I guess the first thing we should do is show that it's Lorentz invariant. So let's do that. Let's show that it's Lorentz invariant. So I have some I gamma mu d mu minus m psi. And let me work this out. Let me see how I want to contract the indices and do all of that kind of thing. I gamma mu lambda minus one mu mu d nu. The m is just a scalar. The psi goes to some new point. Remember, this is uh, you know I should be more explicit. I should be more explicit. This is psi of x. Okay, and this is how it's transforming. Great, and you know I'm just doing my usual thing that we always do. Okay, now I need to take care of this guy. So I have the I, I have the lambda, I have rho sigma, we can say, gamma sigma, lambda minus one, mu mu, d mu, minus m, psi, shifted to some point. Okay, and if you contract all the indices here, what are you left with? Oh God, did I do this the wrong? Yeah, this should be a new, see that? Sorry, that should be a new. Yep, yeah, and if you just contract the indices here and here, you just get, you can rewrite this guy as I, I'm just gonna uh, rename my, uh, sorry, I need to get rid of this. I can rewrite this as I, some gamma sigma, d sigma minus m, psi shifted to a point. Okay, which is obviously Lorentz invariant, right? Contracting the indices, I just get back what I started with. Okay, so it works. It's Lorentz. It's Lorentz and Barrow. So this is L. Good. Any questions? Hopefully, they told you that it was Lorentz and Barrow. Also. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. So now we have two equations. We have the Klein Gordon, and we have Dirac. And you're probably sitting there going, "Why does this tell me anything about spin and fermions and blah blah blah?" Okay, let's 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 do that now. Let's let's program spin. Okay. 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 So let, let's, let's do that. Uh, let's, let's talk about that. So you guys know before we continue that you can actually recover Klein Gordon from the Dirac equation, right? Uh, just by multiplying both sides of the equation by the complex conjugate. So if you take minus I gamma mu D mu minus M and you multiply that and you work out the algebra, you just get back Klein Gordon. So I'm not gonna do that here. It's a very simple calculation. Okay, very good. So what I'm trying to say is in a sense, they are kind of like equipped, they're really not that different. That's what I'm saying, 
I'm just saying we've all we've done is we put in some new technology to handle spin, which we're going to break down now. What what's actually going on? Okay, so uh, let's talk about the Lagrangian now, right? So we need a Lagrangian, but in that Lagrangian, we need Lorentz scalars, right? And so we need to know how to multiply two spinners to get a scalar. Uh, I like the chapter title in Lancaster and Blundell, How to Transform a Spinner. And I read the first section, spinners are not vectors, which is true. Spinners transform pretty weird. So I saw that they told you that this combination of spinners, psi, psi, dagger, if we put that in the Lagrangian, can someone tell me, does this combination yield a Lorentz scalar? All right, so now I want to construct a Lagrangian. And obviously, in my Lagrangian, you need Lorentz scalars, right? Because you want it to be invariant, Lorentz invariant. So now, naturally, you need some combination of spinners. Does, is this combination OK? Hopefully, you, 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 you realize this is not OK. OK, maybe, maybe not. OK, anyways, this, OK, it turns out this is not Lorentz invariant. So just, you know, reread that if you have to. This is not Li. We need a new kind of quantity in this, uh, in this space. OK, and we call it psi bar. OK, and how do we define psi bar? Psi bar is just psi dagger gamma 0. Okay, and it turns out that this quantity, psi psi bar, is Lorentz invariant. Okay, so this is our new quantity, psi bar. This is Lorentz invariant. Uh, it's, it's a spinner, and it's formed with the Hermitian conjugate and my gamma zero matrix. So let's write down the, the Dirac Lagrangian now with that combination in mind. So L Dirac equals what? Hopefully, you've all seen this one. Anyone want to tell me? So it's psi bar, I, gamma mu, d mu, minus m, psi equals zero. Okay, that's the Dirac Lagrangian. And if you enact the Euler Lagrange equations, you will get two Euler Lagrange equations, right? You'll get one for psi and one for psi bar, right? Psi bar is also called the adjoint spinner, adjoint spinner fields at psi. And so you get two, you get our standard I gamma mu, d mu minus m, psi equals zero. And then you get one for psi bar, that just goes minus I gamma mu, d mu minus m, psi bar equals zero. Okay, because you have to solve the euler lagrange equation twice. And you know, if I just distribute this guy, this is just I gamma mu d mu psi minus m psi equals zero. And uh, this guy is just minus I gamma mu d mu psi bar minus m psi bar equals zero. Okay, hopefully they showed you these two equations. Yes? Okay, good. Okay, so let's break down psi. What is psi? Psi is a spinner, but what is a spinner? It's a very hard to describe mathematically, but you're gonna see that it's very similar to just our usual, uh, you know, we had guys like this in quantum mechanics, right? We had two component spinners in quantum mechanics, right? Where, where we had a row or a column matrix, a vector, sorry, with some normalization. It's very similar to that. The only caveat here is we have to break down this whole four component structure. Okay, that's the only caveat. So let's do it. Everyone okay with this? Can I erase this up top? Okay. Okay, so let's, let's begin. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take the spinner. And I'm gonna break it down into two pieces, psi L and psi R. And you're probably like, what is this? 
Actually, you, you won't be like, what is this? Because you've done the reading. So Psi L is a left-handed spinner. Psi right is a right-handed spinner. Okay, you're probably like, mm, okay. It will be very clear why we call these things the way we do. And it has to do with whether they are particles or antiparticles. That is the whole name of the game here. Uh, recall that in spin zero field theory, uh, which we did, uh, we used Bose-Einstein statistics. Uh, we use the fact that antiparticles and particles are identical. And that simplified the theory quite a bit. And now we are going to have to be very careful because we have a change of sign when we go from particle to antiparticle and antiparticle to particle. So that minus sign gives us a bit of hell, but not only that, uh, each individual particle can have its own spin state, right? And so we have to manage all of this technology now. So let's do it. So first of all, how can I write down psi left under some uh, infinitesimal transformation? Uh, so let's, let's write that down. So I can just write it as one minus I theta. So this would be some infinitesimal rotation, right? Dotted with some sigma, oh God, sigma over two minus I beta dotted with some sigma over two. And this would be, sorry, and uh, where do I want this to go? Wait a second, rotations, I don't need that. Okay, and this just corresponds to some infinitesimal rotation and boost, okay? Similarly, I can transform psi right in the same way. This is not so important. I'm just writing this down to show you. If I wanted to do this, I can. I can transform the spinners infinitesimally. Shoot, you need a change of sign. You're gonna see why in a minute. Okay, anyways, let's go to the important bit. So let's go to our Dirac equation. Okay, and let's recall, let's recall the definitions of gamma i, uh, sorry, gamma zero and gamma i, right? So gamma zero is zero, one, one, zero. Gamma i in three space is zero sigma i minus sigma i zero. Let me think about how I want to say this. And now we can rewrite the Dirac equation, plugging in our spinners and also considering the definitions of gamma. So what do I mean by that? So now this term is going to be what? Well, it's going to be a matrix, right? Because this is going to have different pieces coming from the gamma i and the d mu. So what's going to go up here, we're going to have a minus m up here. Why? Because this is in the zero uh, direction, whatever you want to say. It's in the zero, zero piece of this matrix, right? This is zero, zero, right? And so gamma zero, del zero, well, gamma zero is just going to be, have some ones in it, right? Del zero is going to be some time derivative. So this term vanishes and all you're left with is a minus m, right? Does that make sense? That anytime you have a zero in this piece, you're just gonna get minus m because this term is gonna vanish because gamma zero is zero, one, one, zero. I trust you can get there. Okay, okay. Now in this section, it's gonna get a little more complicated. We'll have some I, and you know, you can just work this out. Plus sigma dotted with blah, blah. This is gonna come from the fact that now my gamma I's are zero sigma I uh, minus sigma I and zero, right? Similarly here, we'll have an I 
del zero minus sigma dot nabla. And here we'll have another minus m, uh, all acting on psi. Okay, so this is what our Dirac equation becomes now. Oh, sorry, psi is different now. Now uh, I'll write it down here. Now psi is this psi left, psi right, two component guy. Okay. And this guy equals zero. So is this okay? Did you see? I know you've seen this because I really looked at the chapter this time. So now I know what's, what, was, what was in there. And so now we're sort of, you know, making this weird abstract equation more useful for us. Because now uh, if you just did some matrix multiplication, you could solve this equation. Right? You just kind of multiply the terms out and you'll get two equations. However, we have a little bit of an issue here in that if we do the matrix multiplication, we get we can't really decouple our psi left and psi left equation, or psi right equation, because of this m term. This m term kind of contaminates it because you'll have an n term in the top equation and an m term in the bottom equation. And so I'll just set m equal to zero. And if I do that, <laughs> I get two decoupled equations. What do I mean by that? Well, if I do the matrix multiplication uh, with m equal to zero, well, I get that i del zero plus sigma dot nabla uh, uh, on psi right equals zero. And I get that i del zero minus sigma dot nabla on psi left equals zero. So I get two decoupled equations. Is this okay? Do we, and these are called the whale equa while equations. I know you've seen these. Okay, so now we have something we can kind of work with and actually we should be very happy because we've sort of decoupled them into two separate beasts. Yeah, we have this M issue, but you know, we can laugh about it and then tackle it in a, in a little bit. But this is a very straightforward procedure, hopefully. I haven't done anything crazy yet. Okay, very good. So uh, before we continue, I'm going to do some very common notational things that people do when working this kind of thing. And we'll just uh, do some re reboxing. We'll define the quantity sigma mu as defined as one sigma i in three space. Right, and we'll define the quantity sigma bar mu as one minus sigma i in three space. And so why am I doing this? So I can combine all of the gammas. And so then I can rewrite the gamma mu as zero sigma mu sigma bar mu zero, just notational. And so then the whale equations become I sigma bar dot del psi left equals zero, I sigma dot del psi right equals zero. Okay. So it just gets simplified. Any questions? Anything confusing? Feel free to ask. We can go slower if need be. I know you've seen this as well, this reboxing. It's just convention. Actually, it makes it much nicer because now I don't have to keep writing gamma zero, gamma i, gamma zero, gamma i. I can really write this in gamma mu in the way I want to write it. So does everyone kind of see where we're going a little bit? Yes, good. Okay, let's talk about some free particle solutions. So what are some solutions to the sky? 
So of course, the most natural thing, we can write it as some superposition of plane waves. That should be your natural instinct. Uh, and if we're working on shell, right? So p squared equals m squared, we get some u of p e to the minus i, p dot x for psi. What is u of p? You'll see in a second. Okay, so this is just your basic free particle solution. Uh, U of P is going to be a new column vector that is going to uh, obey some constraints. You're probably, you were probably saying to yourself, how did we, where are we going? There's a transition made from this psi left, psi right language to U and V language. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys or rings a bell. And you should be totally uh, right in seeing that because really at the end of the day, we talk about spinners in terms of U of P and V of P, okay? Or U bar of P and V bar of P. And so I'm just kind of uh, spelling that language out here. I'm just saying psi of X is not just equal to E to the minus I P dot X, but that it's equal to some new thing called U of P, okay? And we define U of P as a two component spinner. So let's write down our Dirac equation. Let's just see how this works. Let's write down the Dirac equation in momentum space. Now, what I'm saying is that U of P should solve this guy. Okay. Can I erase all of this and rewrite this up top? Are we okay? Okay. Okay. So, uh, Let's just write down in momentum space the Dirac equation U of P zero. And uh, let's work in the rest frame. So in the rest frame, P equals P zero equals M and then zero in all the spatial directions, right? Because why? E equals MC squared set C equal to one. And so instead of the energy, I can write M. So now I'm in the rest frame. And so in the rest frame, this becomes M. Let's see. Yes, this becomes M gamma zero minus M U of P zero equals zero just working in the rest frame, which I can rewrite in this way as M minus one, one, one minus one, U of P zero equals zero, just doing the quick algebra. And now we can say what U of P zero is. What is U of P zero that solves it? Well, again, it's a column thing with a normalization square root of M to make the calculations work. Uh, where we have some two numbers. We usually label them with these zetas, okay? And that's our two component spinner that will solve this guy, okay? So now we can kind of describe the spin of our particle uh, using this language. By the way, we have a normalization for the spinners that uh, zeta dagger zeta equals one. Okay, that's just the normalization that we do. So these guys are numerical two component spinners, right? Uh, they, they, they have numbers in them. So something that looked like this, so if u of p zero looked like this, right, it had a one and a zero, well, that's a particle spinning up, okay, in some direction, the three direction. Okay, so now in practice, we don't even really use the language of psi left and psi right. Uh, we use the language of U as a two component spinner, which gives us the spin configuration of the particle. Is everyone? Somewhat okay. Do you have any questions before we continue? Okay. 
I think they use this normalization too uh, in the book. So, okay, very good. So let's let's continue. Let's keep keep plowing. Let's keep building the machinery. Okay, let's talk about uh, what happens under boosts. So under boosts, it can be shown that U of P goes to this transformation, P dot sigma bar square root zeta, that the zetas are transformed under this guy, under a boost. And I know they showed an example uh, that said the ultra relativistic limit, something like that, where they showed this guy under a large boost. So let's just recall what that is. So let's just say zeta is equal to one zero, so spin up in the three, three direction, right? Then I can rewrite U of P. If I take this dot product, you'll find that you get P minus P three, one zero for the spinner, P plus P three, one zero for the spinner, And under a large boost, you find that first of all, you'll end up with one of the spinners left over and you get the normalization square root of 2e if you do this calculation. This is done exactly in the book. So I'm not going to even bother. I like that example that they did. So I'm showing it here, see, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm pulling things in. I actually calculated how to get this using cautious and cinches and blah, blah. It's a very nasty calculation, but if you're interested, I can show you tomorrow. So it can be shown that that's how it looks in a boost and under a large boost, you end up with something like this, which makes sense, right? Because all you're really saying is I have some energy in some direction. That's a, it's, it's really kind of intuitive and simple. Okay, any questions? Okay, similarly, we can say that if zeta was equal to uh, zero one under a large boost, and I, I encourage you to do this calculation, you would get this, this guy. Oh, sorry, you would get this guy. Okay, so that's just under a large boost. So now we can actually go further with this discussion. So, so okay, so now what's the big takeaway so far? The big takeaway is, okay, we're, we've set up this technology with gamma. Gamma is literally, the gammas are literally just a representation of spin one half, not spin one half, sorry, of the Lorentz group. They're really just a representation of SO3 plus one. They just give us some other insight. But what the big takeaway should be from this somewhat technical discussion so far, hopefully it's not so esoteric yet. What the takeaway should be from this discussion so far is that the spinners are the solutions to the Dirac equation. Okay, that, that should be the takeaway. And what we can even say more, more further is that the spinners, the solutions are eigenstates of an operator. Okay, uh, so, so just like in ordinary quantum mechanics, we have some observable or we have some value or quantum number that we can associate with the solutions uh, namely, and it has to do with handedness. By the way, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. There's a particular representation we're working in called, and the representation we're working in for the gamma matrices is sometimes called the chiral representation. So we are working in the chiral representation. Some people do it in different graphs. So 
also sometimes called the while record. So why this guy whale while I don't even know how to have the German inflection. He was a very famous mathematician, Herman Whale. So you know, look him up. He did a lot of good work with this. Chiral is Greek for what? Handedness. So we still don't really know what we mean by right and left, and it's still a little unclear. So, but we'll get there, don't worry. Uh, all I'm telling you is that now we've split this up into a U of P, which is some two component object. But as I was saying, after we have that big takeaway, these guys are eigenstates of some operator uh, and uh, we need a new language. We need a new operator. Does someone remember what these guys are eigenstates of? Starts with an H. It's okay. So they are eigenstates of something called the helicity operator. And so now, and so now, yes. So, and so now uh, all of our uh, spinner states can be associated with an eigenvalue. Those eigenvalues will be helicity, uh, quantum numbers pertaining to helicity. So let's just write down what that operator looks like. Let's just see how that works. And let, 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 let's see mathematically what I even mean by all of that. So I can define helicity H. Let me make sure I do this right. as some p hat dot s. What do I mean by that? Let me make sure. Yes, where s is our standard generator. And I get 1 half the i 0 sigma i sigma i 0 weight p hat. This is the standard momentum operator. And now if I work this guy out, I can say that if a particle has helicity plus one half or minus one half, okay, in our new definition, it's gonna to correspond to a particular handedness of particle. So any particle with helicity plus one half, we say is right-handed. This will be clear in a second, I'll, I'll explain. And minus one half, we say is left handed. And what do I mean physically by this? So physically, literally, helicity means something. Uh, if a particle is right handed, its spin is parallel to its direction of motion. Remember, we talked about this at like the very beginning first lecture. And if it's left handed, it's kind of like in the opposite direction of its motion. Let's say something is moving this way, it's going in the opposite direction of its motion. So yeah, helicity means something. And we will see that spin one half fermions do have some helicity, okay? Or, or they, it's just some kind of way to describe sort of how this, this uh, spin is uh, happening. So what, what can we say about U of P? So U of P is a massless particle so far in a helicity eigenstate, right? It is an eigenstate of helicity. It solves our Dirac equation. Therefore, it's, it's an eigenstate of this operator. Okay, and uh, depending on the spin configuration of U of P, you'll get a particular helicity. Okay, and again, we have to define uh, new Lorentz scalars with these guys. So U bar of P equals U dagger of P gamma zero. And then U bar U, the normalization is 2M zeta dagger zeta. Okay. So this is just our new adjoint, adjoint spinner.
Anything, any questions? Okay, let's summarize. So again, any general solution of the Dirac equation can be written as plane waves. Just summarizing what we've done, because we've done it quite a bit so far. Again, here I'm on shell. And I'm in some advanced time. Oh, sorry, what am I writing here? Some retarded time. Okay, and we have two linearly independent solutions for U of P. So now we have to add this index. I'll explain what, what I'm doing there. All right, so now our spinner has this new index because I can split this up into two separate pieces, right? Which is what we're doing depending on the spin configuration and depending on the helicity of the particle, right? We'll either work with this top guy or this bottom guy sort of individually now, sort of decoupled the two, okay? where S can be one or two, it's just a spin label. And uh, using this language, I can write down, uh, sorry, I can write down the normalization in the following way. This is just normalization, no need to really worry about it. That's how I normalize my uh, states. And so this is sort of the technology we've developed. Okay, however, we're missing a big chunk. We sort of just talked about particles so far. Okay, this works for particles. What about antiparticles? What about negative energy states, right? That's what an antiparticle is. And so I can define a new center. I can call it Vs of P. I'm gonna write up here. I can call it V S of P and now V S of P is going to correspond to negative solutions or antiparticles. All right, so now psi of X will uh, equal some V of P e to the plus I P dot X. I just dissolved that minus sign in the exponential. And now V S of P P dot Sigma minus P dot Sigma bar outside. Uh, uh, now instead of zeta, we use eta for our two component guys, or s is again one to two. Okay, so I've just done the same thing, uh, just backwards, and where eta is just another two component spinner basis. Again, I can write down the normalization. V bar R of S, uh, V S of P equals now minus 2M delta R S. That is the normalization. Any questions before we move forward? This is not easy to work out. You have to sit down and work out each one of these expressions uh, and know how to work with them. And I think Lancaster is very helpful in this because they really break down the calculations, which knock yourself out. Questions, questions, anything. Yeah, let's take a five minute break to 1032 and we will come back and talk about how we wanna sum over spins and we will also begin to quantize the field. You guys are in the trenches now. <laughs> oh. 
Also, do you guys have some time today uh, after Johnson's session, just five, 10 minutes so I can touch base about the research projects with you guys? Okay. Just because it's probably gonna be hard to find another day. And... Olha, you look very, very bewildered. I woke up at four to cover all of that stuff. And I just like had a nap before the class. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, hopefully it's not that confusing. Hopefully it's just being tired. Okay, good. I mean, at this stage, it's just a bunch of rejiggering algebra. It's not, it's nothing too much. I'll be right back. I just got out. Okay, I guess no one needed a break, so let's just just get started then. Oh man. I'm working on a paper for the first time with a math student. It's something, man. It's something. This this kid, kid, what am I saying? This this peer, he's a sophomore. And we're talking about uh, in college, not high school, sorry, college. And we're talking about sort of what his path was. And he goes, yeah, you know, I took multivariable calculus in eighth grade. Just like, oh my God, you know. And actually, ironically, that's like more common to meet people like that. Like it's more, I usually run into people like that. So, uh, not to, not to like, I'm not saying you guys are very advanced for where you are too. I'm just saying that there's so, I mean, it's just amazing what pe kids can do at that age. I think people really like, I think if you gave, if you let kids get more advanced, if you gave them the opportunity, I think people would be shocked how far kids go. I think they just don't get the opportunity to learn stuff because usually their teachers don't know that stuff either. So they can't teach that. But I was, yeah, I was surprised by that. Did he go to a special school? Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Okay, folks, so let's talk about spin sums. So in reality, what's gonna happen in our uh, amplitude calculations is we're gonna have a a variety of spins and polarizations and blah, blah, blah. And so we're going to try and create a technology that allows us to sum over all the spins uh, or, or, or get an average or, or get the most likely spin. It's the best way to put it. And yes, uh, LB did cover this. So I know they did because I really looked in the book. So, so let's just write down a simple expression for it. So we're going to sum over spin matrices, not spin matrices, spinners, U S of P, U bar S of P. Okay, that's basically what I'm doing. So obviously I can recast this into the language I've been using, P dot sigma. P dot sigma bar, zeta, 
zeta. And I'm just summing over all spin configurations. Basically in zeta. So that's U S of P is this guy. Now U bar S of P is going to be this guy. It's just going to be a row vector. I mean, it doesn't really matter. And really I only need one sum. So I'm multiplying this guy by this guy, right? Because this is this, this is this. That's all I'm doing. Okay. And I'm just going to sum over all the spins. And what you get when you do this, you get this crazy expression, you get p dot sigma, p dot sigma bar, square root, square root, and this guy. Then you get p dot sigma, p dot sigma, p dot sigma bar, p dot sigma bar. P dot sigma bar, P dot sigma, and you get this uh, just multiplying the guy out. And again, I can rewrite this. This is just equal to, if I just work out these multiplications, I get a matrix of M, P dot sigma, P dot sigma bar, and then if you work out the multiplication. And from there, it's easy to verify that our spin sum is going to give us this kind of quantity. So if I have a sum over spin, U S of P, U bar S of P, I get gamma dot P minus M. If I have a sum over S, U S of P, U bar S of P, Gamma dot P plus M. Oh, I think I missed a piece Hopefully these two expressions look very familiar. And Johnson is going to verify this at next week's session. He's gonna work through all the algebra. I told him, I always give him the calculations I want him to work out. I've done all of it, but you know, We'll be here another half an hour. It's not worth it. I think you guys are starting to get a, a feel of what I mean when I say that, when you see his full calculations, because they're long. Again, even an expression like this seems very abstract, but it's really not because I mean, what are you getting out? You're getting, forget, forget about the M, you're getting gamma dot P, gamma has some numbers, P has some numbers, you're getting some spin state at the end. It's nothing crazy. Okay, so that's just spin sums. Johnson's gonna do a whole, a whole thing on that. So I'm not gonna, I just wanted to show you the expression and then make it clear that we have to average our polarizations. Also, those of you that like experiments, in reality, if someone's saying is firing a meson, they're not firing a single meson, right? That's not how it works. You're firing a meson beam. There's a beam of mesons and a beam of electrons and a beam, you know, there's beams. And so they all have all kinds of spins. So in practice, you have to average over all the spins, possible configurations and get one final most likely thing. So, okay, before we continue, I'm going to introduce a new notation. So gamma dot P is really, what am I saying? That's just gamma mu P mu, that's the same thing. Uh, and I'm gonna define this new guy, P slash. 
<laughs> the Feynman slash, which hopefully you know. Funny, very funny story about this. There was a great physicist named Fermi, who I hope you all know, and Enrico Fermi had a very brilliant group at the University of Chicago. It's actually kind of like become a famous group because three of his students in that group won Nobel Prizes. And uh, one of his students in that group was Chin Ning Yang, very famous guy, Yang Mills theory. We'll learn about him. Also parity violation and the weak interaction anyways. So they, go, they wanted to learn about quantum electrodynamics, which we'll be learning in a few weeks. And so they went to visit Schwinger. Schwinger was giving lectures, the great, great physicist who you should look up. Schwinger was known for being very not understandable. So they, they went to listen to Schwinger and these brilliant guys came back to the University of Chicago and they spent six weeks and all they did was try to figure out what Schwinger was saying. They couldn't do it. <laughs> so, so then they went to Feynman, they went to visit Feynman. They listened to one hour and they understood everything totally made sense to them. And the one thing that they loved the most that they got that 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 they really remember was this slash. Chin Ning Yang was quoted to say Feynman. The only thing I didn't like about Feynman was his funny notation. But you'll see that it actually is pretty nice. You know. Anyway, so now let's talk about some properties of the Dirac matrices and start creating new products and objects, and we will call these objects bilinears. A bilinear is a mathematical object. Johnson, you can ask Johnson more about bilinears, but basically they're just different products of direct matrices. So the first one is I'm gonna define a gamma matrix gamma five, and I'll define it as I gamma zero times gamma one times gamma two times gamma three. If you do this long multiplication, you get that this guy is equal to minus i over 4. Factorial, epsilon, mu, nu, rho, sigma, gamma, mu, gamma, nu, gamma, rho, gamma, sigma. Okay. So you just get out a new matrix. And here are some properties of gamma 5. If you take the Hermitian conjugate of gamma five, you get back gamma five. Okay, so it is indeed Hermitian. Gamma five squared is equal to the identity matrix. The anti commutator of gamma five with any other gamma mu is equal to zero. The commutator of gamma five with s mu nu, our generator is also equal to zero, they commute. And now you say, what, what is gamma five? <laughs> gamma five is a matrix that goes minus one, zero, zero, one, or it's four by four again, minus one and one or two by two identity matrices. Minus one just says one, minus ones in the diagonal. Okay, now let's define some, uh, you'll see, we use gamma five a lot. So this was your crash course on gamma five. Actually, it's, you should be intuitively saying, ah, I kind of like this. I have minus ones all in the upper portion and I have ones in the lower portion. So again, you can split this up and say a spinner that has only left-handed components with eigenvalue minus, with a, will be an eigenstate of gamma five with eigenvalue minus one. Okay, so it, it works with the gamma five nicely. That's why we use it. Anyway, you'll see, you'll see more in depth. So let's just talk really quickly about different sort of objects we can make and transform. Phi of one, we know that this is a scalar. That's just number. Five something like gamma mu, that's a vector in the 
traditional sense. If I have something like sigma mu nu, which I can define as I over two, gamma nu, gamma nu, what is this guy? That's a tensor, right? Hopefully we, I, I think they even have this chart in the book, so. Now, what about gamma mu gamma five? What is this combination? This is something we call a pseudo vector. Moreover, gamma five on its own is something we call a pseudo scalar. What do I mean by that? This guy, if you keep acting Lorentz transformations on it, it just keeps transforming. Similarly with this and whatever, the scalar, everything. Pseudo vectors and pseudo scalars, if you act on them with Lorentz transformations, every other Lorentz transformation, you'll get a sign change. You can just play around with that, which is the reason for this pseudo designation. Okay, I don't know why, I didn't come up with it. Don't look at me, I, I wasn't there. I wasn't an inventor of this stuff, but. Okay, hopefully this looks somewhat familiar from the book, I, I think. Okay. Okay, great. So all of these guys are fine, they're objects. Now we can combine them and form combinations of them, and we call those combinations bilinears. You can look up why. So let's see, we can form a current with the bilinear, with the Dirac bilinear. So we can have some J mu of X. That looks like this, psi bar of X, gamma mu of X, psi of X. Oh no, why did I write gamma mu of x? Okay, and we can write a current of that form. And that combination, psi bar gamma mu psi, is a Dirac field bilinear. We can also have a j mu five of x, a psi bar of x, gamma mu five of x. Here's another version. Okay, and I can have all kinds of things. I mean. Anyways, whatever. That was a brief digression. I can define some identities. Okay, first of all, let's work out this guy. So now I've defined some currents. Let's work out the derivative of the current. We know that this guy should be zero, hopefully. So we have conserved currents. So we will get d mu by bar gamma mu psi, I'm just using the product rule and distributing that derivative. If you work this guy out, you'll get I m psi bar just from using the definition of the gammas and doing the, sorry, the definition of sine psi bar plus minus I m bar and this indeed equals here.
And we will see that in QED, J mu is going to be called the current density, and it's going to be coupled to the electromagnetic field. So it will have, it will play an important role in the interaction. And similarly, if you do D mu, J mu five, you just carry out the derivatives. You do not get zero. You get two I m psi bar and five psi. Okay, this guy is what we call the axial current. Okay, this is a different quantity. It's not going to be what we couple to the uh, E and M field. Notice that current is only conserved here when M equals zero. Okay, right, because then that guy's just zero. And so there are times we will use this axial current, but uh, it's not that useful. You guys saw projection operators too, right? In the book? I mean, it's not so important. We can define some J mu left, a left-handed current. So now we have to take that current and define it for each guy. And we have a psi bar, gamma mu, one minus gamma five over two psi. That's J mu left. Similarly, J mu right, psi bar, gamma mu, one plus gamma five over two psi. Okay, that's our right-handed and left-handed current definition. And again, J mu and J mu five are our know their currents. Okay, one more thing to note before we continue. Notice also that the Lagrangian is invariant under some symmetries. Really, we can say psi of x is it's invariant when psi of x goes to e to the i alpha psi of x. Okay, so we have some symmetry there in our Lagrangian. This is a gauge symmetry. So now we're introducing some kind of gauge symmetry or gauge invariance into our program. This is a symmetry of the Lagrangian, obviously. And similarly, if we have psi of x goes to e to the i alpha gamma five psi of x, well then as you know, this is only a symmetry now when m equals zero because of the way the know their current comes out. And this is called a chiral transformation. Uh, Suffice to say, we will have a lot to say about this guy, the gauge transformation or the gauge symmetry, right? And we will see that QED, which we won't be doing until after the S matrix. So in two weeks, we'll do QED. We will see that QED is a U1 gauge theory. And U1 will correspond to these kinds of transformations. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> okay, good. I don't know whether this whether to say good or good or good. I don't know what kind of good I should say. Okay, we're running out of time, but uh, 
Let me see. Okay. Okay, I'm going to end on one note, and then I'm going to talk about what we are going to cover next time. Because okay, we covered a lot today, I don't want to, I want you to get used to this technology. We can also write products of these Dirac bilinears. First of all, I'll define this identity. where epsilon alpha beta is the anti-symmetric tensor. Similarly to epsilon gamma delta is anti-symmetric. And so now if I use that identity, I can write down products of my bilinears in the following way. So let's say I have this combination. I have u bar one right sigma mu, u bar two right. These are different components of the spinner. U bar three right, sigma mu, u four right. You can show that this combination of bilinears is just equal to u bar one right let me just make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah, sigma mu u4 right times u bar 3 right, sigma mu u2 right. Okay, this is something called a fears identity. Uh, it's very straightforward if you just know what all these guys are. And that is something Johnson will show next week. There are many of them. I just wanted to show you some of these when you're playing around with this. Okay, so for next week, let's talk about next week. And then I will hand it to Johnson. Yeah, I have five minutes. We'll talk about where we're headed next week. Can I erase? Oh. Okay, good. Okay, next week. Let's let's give a brief. So today we really just set up the spinner technology. That's the best way to look at it. Okay. Next week we have to quantize the Dirac field. Next week. I thought we'd be able to do it today. I was a bit ambitious. So we have to quantize the rack field. Uh, that's pretty easy, right? We just need anti, no, oh, we need no, no commutation relations now, anti-commutation relations, which hopefully you know why that's important because of the sign difference between particles and antiparticles. So we need to quantize the drag field, that means we need anti-commutation relations, that means we need a Hamiltonian, that means we need, uh, we need what? What else do we need? We need mode expansions. Uh, uh, what else do we need? That's basically it, right? And really what we want to compute, I mean, that's the main thing, right? And this is what? This is like three lines of writing. It's not that big of a deal now. Then I want to show you the Dirac propagator. Which again is not so bad. Again, that involves computing something like this. But now we have the adjoint fields instead of just a different field. So we have to compute this guy. 
And then after we do that, which shouldn't take long at all, if I had another 15 minutes, I'd be able to do this. But, and then we'll move on to the S matrix, which will be a reading. and deriving the rules and Wick's theorem and all that kind of thing, where we will now have a Lagrangian that's what? One half e mu i squared minus one half m squared phi squared minus now lambda over four factorial. Okay, we're going to have this new term. Sorry. Okay. Do I want to cue a quota? Yeah, five to the fourth. Okay. Okay. Where uh, this guy is now our interaction. So really the S matrix involves Interactions. So we're going to add interactions to the story. Finally, finally. no more free theories. Okay. So that is where we will be next week. We will work with this pesky guy. Very annoying. This ruins everything, really. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's the whole point. Okay, and again, the homework is 15, 18, 19, 20. 15 is on discrete symmetries. I'll say a quick word about discrete symmetries. So discrete symmetries are three of them, charge, conjugation, parity, and time reversal. You'll learn what they mean when you read, do your reading. It was long thought that discrete symmetries were absolute symmetries of nature that could not be broken. Uh, or combinations of them cannot be broken. Uh, it turns out that two of them can be broken and have been observed to be broken. And people have won prizes for that. And the weak interaction, for example, breaks parity. Uh, so very interesting. Also, before I hand it over to Johnson, I did, the, I did the math, okay, for you guys. I wanted to see how many Nobel prizes were awarded for quantum field theory, basically, the standard model, quantum field theory. 49 Nobel Prizes have been awarded for work towards quantum field theory. I just wanted to say that. So I, I think it is the singular, this, I, I just like to put it in perspective because I am biased, yes, but I do believe that this thing, this, this quantum field theory and the standard model is the biggest triumph of intellectual uh, pursuits. It is, the, it is the biggest triumph. Uh, you know, I'm a little biased, take it with a grain of salt, but when you have that much given for this sort of construction, it's a big deal. Now this S matrix thing was a huge advance. And frankly, this was the biggest contributions Schwinger, Feynman, and Tamanaga made. This was like there, and Dyson. You'll see that Freeman Dyson played a very important role in this. Uh, and you will use the Dyson expansion, but really this is a big deal. This is like what they really contributed and worked a number of years on to develop and what they eventually won their prize for. So you're gonna learn it. You're actually gonna know what they did. Pretty cool. Okay, folks, any other questions? As always, I'll be here tomorrow morning. I will be here after Johnson's session for a few minutes to talk to those doing research, uh, or all of you can stay because I just want to touch base, give you some more things to read. And uh, yeah, okay. I'll see you next week and after the session. Okay, Johnson, take it over. I'll make you host.